Hi everyone, this will be a five minute recap of today's Chalk Talk at the University of Colorado UC Health Hospital for the inpatient teams. We talked about pruritus and polycythemia. So today specifically, we talked about a female patient that presented with generalized itching and the residents did a great job eliciting some more information. And the main teaching point here was to look at itching from a big bucket standpoint. And remembering that itching can be broken down into five main subcategories, uh, largest being dermatologic itching, then systemic causes, then neurologic causes, psychiatric causes, and then miscellaneous. Remembering also that itching should also be divided into local versus diffuse. Most local itching is a result of dermatologic conditions, allergic, urticarial, infections or infestations are all in that local category. There are often also skin findings present with this type of itching and that can really help us delineate between dermatologic versus the other causes. The other causes tend to be more diffuse with the exception of neurologic causes, but systemic are all causes that cause diffuse itching. Most notably here are end-stage liver disease as a result of elevated bilirubin levels, and stage renal disease, as well as hematologic malignancies. Finally, remembering that medications can always lead to diffuse itching, and to, so doing an excellent med drag would be important for any patient presenting with itching. Up to date has an excellent division of these subcategories that you can look into, but I've presented that here for a quick review. While we didn't talk about treatment at our conference, I wanted to bring some points about treatment in this presentation. Remembering that pruritus treatment really focuses on treating the underlying cause when it is systemic. Otherwise, for local pruritus related to dermatologic conditions, hydrating the skin, staying in a cool environment, avoiding stress and irritants are important, as well as local steroids, Capsaicin, calcineurin inhibitors, anesthetics, or phototherapy can also be utilized. Dermato our dermatology colleagues can help us better understand which treatments will be most suitable for our patient. For systemic therapies, most commonly when we get called about itching as a cross cover problem in the more acute setting, a go to medication is hydroxyzine. Um, and then diphenhydramine, but that can be somewhat sedating. And so using that judiciously is important. And then opioid receptor antagonists are also helpful for systemic therapies. There are some novel therapies also emerging, but these should be used with caution and with an expert opinion. So moving on to the case, we later find out that on exam, the patient has a ruddy complexion on her face. She also has hypertension and um, ultimately was revealed in labs that she has a very high hemoglobin at 19.6. And so the concern here is that the patient has polycythemia um, here as she also has an elevated white count, but ultimately she has this erythrocytosis, which we'll also refer to as polycythemia for the rest of this case. We wondered whether this was related to primary or secondary causes and um, decided to order a sleep study, an EPO, and a JAK2 level, and then ultimately depending on the results of these, potentially a bone marrow biopsy. This patient's EPO level was low and she did have a JAK2 mutation detected, and so ultimately she was diagnosed with polycythemia vera. To summarize polycythemia vera, uh, history and exam findings are typically itching, redness, splenomegaly on exam is often found, and then neurological changes such as paresthesias are also common due to capillary stasis with elevated hemoglobin levels. On labs, uh, typical cutoffs are 16.5 for hemoglobin for men and 16 for women. For um, additional labs for polycythemia vera particularly, the EPO level should be low and a JAK2 mutation can be detected. Um, ultimately, bone marrow biopsy can also be utilized to diagnose this condition. Um, often LDH and AST levels can be elevated given some hemolysis. The complications related to elevated hemoglobin levels are things like thrombosis, CVA, and MI. 
And then treatment for primary polycythemia is therapeutic phlebotomy. The hematocrit goal for this should be less than 45%. I wanted to point out here that polycythemia related to secondary causes, phlebotomy should be used with caution as polycythemia is our body's way of compensating for things like chronic hypoxia, or as a response to elevated EPO levels and hematolo hematology consult should be obtained prior to performing phlebotomy for patients in whom polycythemia is due to a secondary condition. Here is the World Health Organization diagnostic criteria for polycythemia vera. As we mentioned, there are hemoglobin and hematocrit cutoffs, bone marrow biopsy showing uh, hypercellularity or a presence of JAK2 mutation, and then a minor criterion is a subnormal or low serum EPO level. The diagnosis of PV requires meeting all three major criteria or the first two major criteria and the minor criteria, which our patient did meet. And then one of our residents during conference asked whether aspirin was indicated for patients with polycythemia vera. And yes, there are studies that demonstrate that low dose aspirin, and in the studies, the low dose meant 40 to 100 milligrams. And so you can use our standard 81 milligram dose aspirin as primary prevention for thrombotic events. And so patients diagnosed with polycythemia vera should be placed on aspirin if they, know have, if they don't have any contraindications. These contraindications can be found on the treatment page for polycythemia vera on up to date as well. So that was a quick recap of our case conference for today, remembering the broad differential for pruritus and then a diagnosis of polycythemia vera. Thanks everyone uh, for those who attended and I hope you learned something.